Continuing our studies in the book of Romans, we're in Romans 11. We're going to look at a few verses from verses 17 through 24 this evening. And my message is entitled, No Place for Pride. But before we get to that, <clears throat> I want to tell you, Jan, our um, church administrator and church elder, she had emergency surgery this afternoon. Um, and so lift her up in prayer. Um, when I checked about a half hour ago, she was still in surgery. So pray for Jan. Um, surgery was supposed to commence at 3 o'clock, and they said it was going to be about a four-hour surgery. So hopefully um, with, uh, with God's uh, blessings, everything's going to work out. And so we'll just continue to pray um, and, uh, and wish her a speedy recovery, and hopefully she'll be back with us in no time. Um, also, this um, Saturday is the, the full gospel um, uh, uh, Good Samaritans with Frank and Kenny and those guys. So, um, church this, this uh, Saturday, um, lunch, everybody's expected to be here. And, um, bring a friend. And, um, we'll take what it time, from there. What time? What time? One o'clock to, one o'clock to, uh, to three o'clock. Two hours. This Saturday. You're the big booster. You gotta tell the whole neighborhood. <laughs> Herald it in the streets. That's some of it. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we just lift up Jan this evening. And Lord, you know the concerns, you know the the issues that she faces, but Lord, we know that you're a bigger God than our problems, you're a bigger God than her medical issues. And we just pray that your loving touch would be upon her. Her husband, Mo is worried. They're up in age. And so, Lord, in their present condition, we just pray, Lord, that you would give them peace of mind, that you would give the surgeons and her medical doctors wisdom in terms of her treatment and care and surgery. Bless her even now, Father God, and help her and be with her. Let your healing hands touch her and anoint her and Bless her body from the top and the crown of her head to the heels of her feet and be with her and help her, Lord. She's crying out to you and calling out to you, Father God, and expecting a, a good outcome. And we pray for that, Lord, even now. We thank you for the word as it goes forth this evening. Bless the word. Anoint the word, Lord. And may your word come across with wisdom and understanding. And Lord, as your brother James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, he's to ask of God. And you will give them wisdom abundantly and liberally, as <coughs> you promised. Bless us even now with that wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that we can put aside the cares that we have, the concerns that we have, the worries that we have, and that we can focus in for the next short period of time and your precious word, which brings light and life <coughs> into each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And to those who are sneezing, God bless you. God bless you. Turn off your phones, please. Um, I hate to come out swinging for the first phone that rings, but we will if we have to. Like I said, this evening's message is called No Place for Pride. And Romans chapter 11 is kind of a, a difficult um, text for us to grasp. A friend of mine who just recently passed away, Pastor Barney Odifer um, from Covenant Christian Church in Rochester Hills, um, I just met with him about a month and a half ago, and uh, he said, Pastor Curtis, make sure you tell him that nothing matters except Christ. Amen. And he said, the young people need to know that before it's too late. And this guy was just the the commensurate pastor. Tell them all about Jesus. Tell them nothing else matters except Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, it was kind of funny because Barney was pretty advanced in his in his age, and we were supposed to um, we were supposed to have lunch together. When I got to his house, he wasn't uh, he wasn't feeling very well, even though we had an appointment together. And he decided not to go to lunch, but we sat and talked for a while and. Um, his health was in a rapid declining state and you know nothing matters except Christ that was his words mm -hmm. and even though most of us would agree that's true you know sometimes you have to wonder why it takes sickness or tragedy for us to actually believe it 
Nothing matters except Christ. Um, you know, it's funny because a lot of people, they chase things their whole life, and when they finally get what they want, they wonder, well, <coughs> what am I going to do with this? And now I want something else. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, I have to admit that I spent a lot of my younger years chasing things, not the things that you would think, but in business I wanted this piece of equipment, or I thought if we could get to this sales level, or if we could get to this situation, how much better things would be. And then when you got there, it's like, so what? What's next? And, um, you know, it's funny because a lot of people spend their days and their months and their years chasing that elusive pot of gold, gold at the end of the rainbow. And then when they finally reach that pot of gold, they realize the pot is empty because somebody else was there to steal the gold before they got there. <laughs> but, you know, when we think about it, you know, this... The statement, nothing matters except Christ. You know, for some of us, it takes us an entire lifetime to learn this lesson. And those of us who have learned it, nothing matters except Christ. We learn it, then we forget it. Then we have to relearn it, then we forget it again. And most of us, if we really were honest with ourselves, we're still in the learning process because from time to time, you know, something else catches our eye, something else catches our interest. And then we go off and we... We're on this tangent or that tangent, and it even happens in the Christian community. I have a few friends, you know, oh, you know, we got to go see this person, or so-and-so's in town, we got to go there, or we got to drive to St. Louis to the, you know, to the uh, to the National Prayer House, and, you know, we have to pray here, we got to pray there, go see this minister on the West Coast or the East Coast or some coast, and, you know, they're chasing stuff, and it's like... Sometimes they chase people more than they chase God. And it's like, what are you doing? And um, it's funny because I had a friend who used to minister at um, Freedom Hill, which was at 16 and, and Shaner. And, um, you know, he moved, his, he moved to Oakland Township. Then he moved his Bible study to Rochester. And um, another one of my friends is like, I'm not driving out to Rochester. I'm not chasing a guy that teaches the Bible. And it was funny because I continued for a number of years to go out to this Bible study in Rochester. And he's like, well, I'm not going to spend the gas, but if you're going out there, I'll ride with you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I always thought it was kind of funny because, you know, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't consider going out there. But since I continued to go out there, you know, the influence that we have on other people. You know, in one of her books, Alicia, Elizabeth Elliot Whose, whose husband was killed um, as a missionary, she, she remarked that, you know, Christians in, in you know, Christian growth is, is really the process of destroying the idols in our lives one by one. And we might not realize what our idols are. Some of us, you know, it, it might be just idiosyncratic behavior that we have. Some of us, it's anger. Some of us, it's the lusts and the desires of our hearts. But all of us have idols one way or the other. And, you know, you might say, idols? I don't have any idols. But if you really thought about it, you probably do. And this is painful because, you know, we think, well, our idols give us meaning. Our idols give us significance. It was kind of funny because I used to like brand new Cadillacs. And I'd get a brand new Cadillac on a, on a regular basis. And as soon as they came out with a new model, I'd want the newest one. And I had myself convinced at one time that, you know, it's just cheaper to trade them in than fix them. You know, trade them in every year, year and a half. And, um, you know, it's like, well, when you buy a new car off, the, off the, the, the showroom floor, you drive it off and you lose about a third of its value. Right. And, yeah. um, and then you drive it for a year, year and a half, and it loses about half of its value. And then you wonder, what the heck am I doing? I don't need a, a Cadillac that big. And at this point in life, it's like, as long as it rolls, I don't even care what it looks like so much. So, I mean, you know, priorities change over time. When we think more about Jesus and think less of ourselves, we get the idea that the things of this world mean less and less. But, you know, we hate the idea of giving up what we want because, you know, we fear deep down inside that we'll be nothing without the things that we yearn for, the things we lust for, the things that we desire. But really... If we really focused on, on, on Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God. 
Seek first his righteousness. And then he'll add those things unto you that you really need instead of the things that you, you think you want. And, um, you know, I, I think that God says, tells us in many places that we, we have to let things go in our lives. Um, listen to the word of the Lord from Isaiah 42.8. Um, in this particular trance of scripture, he says, I am the Lord, and Lord is in all caps. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement, but it's even stronger when you consider the context of what is, is spoken here by the prophet Isaiah, because when Aaron allowed the people to make a golden calf, Moses ordered that that calf be melted down. And most of us, that's about all of the story that we know. The calf should have been melted. But not only was the calf melted down, the residue of the melted calf was mixed with water, and Moses made the people of Israel drink that water that they idolized from the calf. And that's in Exodus 32, verses 19 and 20, if you don't believe me. But, you know, I mean, some people like mixed cocktails. Talk about mixed drinks. You know, the, the calf was melted and mixed with water, and here, take a drink. And uh, it wasn't suggested that they drink. It was ordered that the people, you know, drink from, from that. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that God's anger burned against the Israelites because of their idolatry. His anger burned. I mean, imagine God's anger being so out of whack that it, it burned against you or burned against, you know, a, a people group. You know, and I think this is a divine object lesson teaching us that God will share his glory with no one or anything. And, um, you know, sometimes we think, well, that's kind of harsh, but, you know, we have to put God first and learn to put God first. And it takes training and it takes some of us a lifetime to really understand that. But then when you think about it, since the golden calf and since the, the Israelites way back there, I mean, thousands of years have passed. And today, we still need that same very warning in the present context. And I think the text that we're going to look at this evening from Romans 11, verses 17 through 24, it brings us face, face to face with this truth by means of, the sto of another story, the story of the olive tree. And before we jump into our text this evening, remember that Paul is dealing with the vexing question of Jewish unbelief in, in this particular context. And, you know, this is an issue that seems kind of remote for most of us, but yet I think if we inquired, it would require a, a deeper bit of introspection. And we find that this question leads some very, to some very interesting, profound truth regarding our own sinful pride. I, I look at my own previous life, and I didn't see it at the time, but I look back and think, you know... Um, you know, you wanted this and you wanted that. It was funny because, um, you know, after 17 years of, of marriage, my, my first marriage ended because of some sinfulness on behalf of my spouse. And um, we lived in Gross Point at the time, and we had lived there for 15 years. And, um, you know, in my pride, I thought, well, I'm just going to find another home in Gross Point, and it's going to be bigger than the last one. Well, we already had a huge home in Gross Point. It's like, then I'm thinking, well, at that time, I'm by myself. What do I need a big house for? Because with a big house, you have to have a landscaper and a housekeeper and, you know, on and on and on and on. And it's like, you know, after after some prayer time, you know, God kind of temp tempered me a little bit. And it's like, you know, you don't need to be here at all. You know, this is, this is a land that you should be pretty much done with. Not that it was a problem living in Gross Point. I loved living there for... For a number of years, but I just didn't see the need to to have a, a bigger place or, or keep a bigger place or or want all those things, those trappings that I thought were important at the time. So when we look at Romans 11, Paul argues the about the Jewish rejection of Jesus was not a total rejection. We've seen that last time we studied this a couple weeks ago, um, in verses one through ten. Now he develops the thought that Israel's rejection is not final. Um, and then he sees a time when God will pour out his spirit amongst the Jewish people at the end of this age and multitudes 
of Jews will come back to Christ. And we see that in verses 25 and 26. But this is still all future to us. It hasn't happened yet. And it would be easy for Gentiles to think, you know, the Jews were in and now they're out and now we're in. So we got it made. And, um, you know, that sort of thinking also kind of leads to some prejudice and even some anti-Semitism. But at a deeper level, all of this should cause us to think that because we know the Lord, you know, that we're somehow better than other people. You know, and I think this is foolish thinking. And Paul offers us some serious warnings. I want to talk about those warnings from this text. And then um, somewhere before midnight, I'll wrap this message up. <laughs> the first warning of the three warnings that I've seen in the text as I studied this is, is, is found in verses 17 through 18. And it says, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in amongst the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Yeah. I mean, this is, this, is really, this is really great text and and an explanation of the symbolism here from this text will help us kind of understand what Paul is trying to convey. First of all, we know that the root is the covenant promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. That's the root. And, and God is the root of all things. We were grafted in. And the tree that um, Paul speaks of here is the true believers in every age who embrace the covenant promises of God. And then it talks about nourishing sap. That's the blessing of salvation from God. And then the cultivated broken branches is referring to the unbelieving Israelites or Israel. And then the wild uncultivated branches is us, the believing Gentiles. And then grafted in means that salvation has now been extended to us, the Gentiles, and it wasn't extended to us initially. And perhaps maybe a modern illustration could help us along the way. Imagine that there's a group of, of guys working in a factory. And for years, they complained that management doesn't appreciate them. You know, management's underpaid them for, for quite some time. They're overworked. They're underpaid. The boss never gives them any credit or kudos for what they do. And... Um, and uh, the boss constantly reminds them that, uh, you know, anybody could replace them at any time. You know, they complain, they gripe, they belly ached, you know, and finally their boss says, I'm going to give you everything that you ask for, and then ten times more besides. You know, I will bless you beyond your wildest demands and your wildest dreams. But the workers by then were so given over to bitterness and so given over to having a hard heart and anger and everything else, they didn't believe a word the boss said. And so, you know, he said, well, we'll show you, buddy. You know, you can't treat us this way, and you're never going to treat us right because you haven't treated us right all these, all these years. So all of the workers walk out on the boss because, you know, you know, contrary to what the offer on the table was, it's better than anything that they've ever had. But they just decide, we quit. They walk out. And, you know, you might say, well, that illustration seems kind of absurd because who would walk out on a deal, you know, that's better than anything they've ever had before? But that's precisely what the Jews did. They walked away from Jesus, from something better than they've ever had before. They said no deal to heaven's ultimate offer. And what does the owner do the, that's running this factory? You know, after his original workers turned down his fabulous offer, he says, you know, I got to keep my business going. So he hires replacement workers. He brings the replacement workers in and they start doing the same work that the original complaining guys did. And the factory stays in business while the guys who turned down the incredible contract, they're on strike. And when you think about it, were those replacement workers? The, Israel, the Israelites are out for the most part. Some of them not all of them, but most of them. And we stepped in to where they were at one point. 
And the Gentiles got in on the deal because the Jews rejected the offer that God had for them. And so, you know, we were out of work, out of luck, heading for disaster until the door, the Lord opened that door and said, you know, come on in. You know, I'm going to give you guys a chance. I'm going to make this work. And for one thing, you know, many Jews have come to Christ in the present age. Um, and as we hurtle headlong, I think, into the last days, you know, the trickle of Jews coming to Jesus is just a trickle, and then it's gaining a little bit of, of steam. But one day, the, the trickle would become, you know, more of a massive flood of Jewish people coming to Christ for salvation, the gift that they previously rejected. And this is the whole point of Romans chapter 11. God says, if my chosen people want back in, I can bring them back at any time. And he will. And this offer is still on the table this, to this day. You know, the offer that God offered them initially. And just because they walked out on the deal 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that God's written them off forever. You know, God still offers the gospel to the Jews. And they can accept it anytime, at any at any stage. And where does that leave us Gentiles? First, we should be profoundly grateful that God has found a way to bring us in. Okay. Secondly, we ought to marvel at God's wisdom because his plan is just absolutely awesome for everyone. You know, that he could use the unbelief of the Jews to open the door to the rest of the world. The Jews slam the door and that opened the door for us. And third, and this is Paul's major point, you know, don't get a big head. It's so easy for us to get prideful and, and, and get ahead of ourselves. But don't just think that because you're in and the Jews are out, therefore you're somebody special. Um, the end of this passage reminds us of the kindness and the severity of God. Not just his kindness to let us in, but his severity as well. And don't take this for granted. It says, don't boast, don't be arrogant. And God says that he can take the natural branch, the Jews, and put it back on and then break you off. And, you know, because basically the text tells us that we're nothing but a wild olive branch anyways, and we don't even belong there. But because of his grace and mercy, we were grafted in. The only difference is that you have believed and the Jewish people have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And if they will believe, they can be grafted back in at any time. And, you know, this is kind of some pretty heavy theology. Some of us, they read this text and they just don't really understand it. I tried to make it as simple as I can, but, you know, um, I'm not trying to make some kind of super big theological statement here, but you can think on this for a while and you know we're not originally invited to the table or to the party but because some people didn't come you know the table opened up for us it's like going to a fancy restaurant and you don't have a reservation and you know there's there's no tables available and then you just show up and you find out that you know a table that was meant for somebody else those people didn't come and oops there's a table available so you just walk in and you get served just like everybody else and so when that table that you realize wasn't available becomes available, you're grateful and you enjoy the feast. But, you know, don't look down your nose at those who didn't show up. They can always come back. The, the second warning is found in verses 19 through 21. And the second warning is don't be proud. It says in the text, you will say then, Branches were broken off so that, I, so that I could be grafted in, granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid, for if the Lord did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Mm -hmm. um, and this is probably one of the most serious warnings in the entire New Testament. It doesn't sound that serious on face value um, uh, when... James Montgomery Boyce preached this passage um, from Romans. He devoted a whole section of his sermon to what he called the fall of national churches. He mentions a number of examples of churches that once knew God, 
<clears throat> once knew of God's blessing, but then over time, because of indifference and being lethargic, and in some cases, you know, just being uh, unfocused, they completely disappeared. I mean, we can think of all the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelations 2 and 3. You know, this is the, the scene of, of Paul's extensive missionary labors, the churches of Asia Minor. And this is where the church first expanded outside of Judea, outside of Galilee. And then by the end of the first century, there were thriving churches all over Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. And if you read Revelation uh, chapters 2 and 3, you can see that amidst all the vitality of these churches of Asia Minor, you know, there were already serious signs of problems, moral compromise, doctrinal lackness, spiritual indifference, zeal but without love, all kinds of problems within the church. And Paul warned the churches that he would come <clears throat> and remove the candlestick, the light of God. And so this is a sign of God removing his presence, God removing his blessing, if they didn't repent um, from their, their issues. And Dr. Boyce points out that many of the early church fathers, they came out of Asia Minor, including um, Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nicenesis and Gregory of Nisus. In, but over time, the church completely lost its vision. The church completely lost its passion. The church completely lost its purity. And first the church declined, and then the next thing that happened was, then the church churches disappeared. And that's a sad thing that happens to a lot of churches. You know, and every single one of the seven churches of Revelation ceased to exist. And um, once the Muslims conquered Turkey, Christianity virtually disappeared in modern-day Turkey. And today, the land where Paul did so much of his missionary work remains a mission field because the Muslims have taken over. And along the same lines, we can think of the church in North Africa. You know, the church in North Africa produced the greatness of Augustine and um, Trillium. And some of the greatest thinkers of the earliest church came from North Africa. But it too lost its vitality. It too was overtaken by Islam. And today, North Africa remains solidly an Islamic fold. And from being the birthplace of many great theologians, Christian theologians, North Africa has become one of the hardest areas for Christians to witness because it's so solidly Islam. And Dr. Boyce even speaks of the church in Italy which thrived despite decades of persecution by the Roman Empire. And eventually, under Constantine, Christianity became accepted in Rome and the Roman Empire. And then the Holy Roman Empire was born, and the church no longer was persecuted. And the church then became protected and favored. But as often as the case, once the persecution ended, so did the spiritual vitality of the church. They were persecuted, they grew. When the persecution was gone, the church became, went into decline. And, um, you know, then um, the vitality of their Christian witness disappeared, culminating in centuries of church corruption, the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church, and many of the church leaders sold salvation through a system of indulgences, mm -hmm. which provoked Martin Luther to post his 95 thesis in 1517, you know, um, which sparked the Protestant Reformation more than 500 years ago. But it's easy to take a swipe at the Catholic Church, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. History is what it is, and the problem rests not just with the Catholic Church. The problem rests inside of every human heart, where we fight the battle against pride and arrogance and most of the time we lose because our fallen human nature rears its ugly head and whispers to us words like, you deserve this, you're better than the rest, you've earned it. And these seductive whispers come with the hiss of hell. And that's why many great churches have fallen over time. And then there's the great Reformation churches of Europe. 
When you think about the Great Reformation that sprang across Europe, they had state churches in places like Sweden and Denmark and England and Norway. These were all state-controlled churches. But the state churches today are largely dead and mostly empty. You know, they have a form of religion, but they deny the true power of God in the gospel. Too many of the state churches in, in Europe, they've become too complacent, they've become too indifferent, they become fat, bloated, unconcerned, uncaring, without vision, prideful, judgmental, and ultimately irrelevant. And that's why fewer than 4% of all Europeans mm. attend church today. So that means 96% of Europeans don't even bother with church. And you go to Europe and you see these magnificent church structures. They're beautiful when you visit them, but you'll enjoy the art architecture, but don't plan on hearing a gospel message in most of them. That ended generations ago. They don't preach the gospel in these churches. They're just magnificent works of architecture. They're mostly museums to the creative genius to those who originally built them. You can put up a sign in front of most of the churches, a great church once worshipped here, but no longer. See, Europe and Great Britain, which gave birth to another evangelical movement, became part of the mission field because the churches largely are dead. Mm -hmm. But then you go back to America. What about churches in America? One wonders if things in America are any better. Mm -hmm. It's quite true that amongst all the nations of the West, America has the highest rate of church attendance of any other nation in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's true that we still have the words under God in our Pledge of Allegiance, even though it's been challenged. It's further mm -hmm. true that many conservative evangelical churches are thriving, including newer churches with innovative ways of communicating the gospel and innovative ways of worshiping. But the influence of Christianity in our culture unquestionably is on the decline. You know, because public symbols of our faith are being removed one by one from this land. Many of the mainline churches are in serious trouble in America because they follow the line of least resistance in terms of both doctrine and morality. Just go with the flow. You know, one is only to think about the ongoing debate, which is still a debate within the Episcopal Church. You know, about 16 or 17 years ago, the Episcopal Church elected Catherine um, Jeffords um, uh, Shorey as the presiding bishop, an openly gay female lady, to be the presiding bishop of the entire Episcopal Church in America. And in one of her sermons, when she first became bishop um, at their convention in Columbus, Ohio, she referred to Jesus as Mother Jesus because she said that effectively that we have to transgender the Son of God. And um, Andrew Newman wrote a commentary on how this actually happened. He said at the convention's closing, the presiding new bishop preached that Colossians calls Jesus the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead. That sweaty, bloody, tear-stained labor of the cross brings and bears new life. Our mother Jesus gives birth to this new creation, and you and I are his children. Mother Jesus. Our mother Jesus. Not just any mother Jesus. And Bishop um, Shori, she felt no need to cloak her language or even apologize and you know, she didn't want to scandalize the average Episcopalian who doesn't have much doctrine to start with. So, tossing aside the New Testament, she transgendered our Lord with a qualm, without a qualm amongst her ranks or amongst most uh, Episcopalians and for all the world to hear because it was a public convention. In an interview with CNN, she was asked that uh, the question if, if homosexuality is a sin. And this is what the good bishop said. I don't believe so. I believe that God created us with each different gifts. Each one, of, each one of us comes into this world with a different collection of things that challenge us 
and brings us joy and allows us to bless the world around us. Some people come into this world with affections ordered towards other people of the same gender, and some people come into this world with affections directed at people of the other gender. It's just the way it is. Hmm. You know, it's kind of crazy because Cal Thomas addressed this matter in a different way. He said, well, maybe the question for the great bishop and her, her fellow heretics should be this. If homosexual practice is not sin, then what is sin? And how do we know? Or is the matter of thus saith the opinion polls instead of thus saith the Lord? Lobbying groups rather than God himself and what he has to say. With the bishop's doctrine of inclusion, why exclude anyone? How about applying the religious equivalent to open borders and let into the church everybody, including unrepentant prostitutes, murderers, liars, thieves, and all atheists? If the Episcopal Church denies what is clearly taught in the scripture about important matters like sexual behavior, why expect its leaders to have any conviction about anything else? And this includes the directions to heaven. How can anybody be sure if this guidebook, our Bible, is so full with errors? His conclusion is shortened to the point. Conservative Episcopalians are too few in number to stop the theological drift. If they intend to persevere their congregations without further theological seepage, they should come out from amongst them and separate themselves. And the Presbyterians have the same problem as the Episcopalians. You know, we now have been told that the Holy Trinity is sexist because it's only the masculine father and son. You know, and there was a cartoon editorial by Doug Marlett in USA Today. And in this cartoon editorial, it says, let's, let's play a game where the contestants say, name that Trinity. Under, the banner, under this banner, the Presbyterian Church USA General Assembly, the first person who says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the second person says Mother, Child, and Womb, the third person says Rock, Redeemer, and Friend, and the fourth person might as well just say Rock, Paper, Scissors, because it doesn't matter. <laughs> the caption reads, bad news, we just got the word about the Episcopalians are praying for us too. But why should any of that surprise any of us? Once you leave the solid rock of biblical authority, you step into the quicksand of shifting public opinion where anything goes and no one can tell you that you're wrong. The doctrinal defection runs, de defections run deep across the country's true believers inside every denomination. And we as Christians have tough choices to make. It's going to come down to property. Who owns it? Who keeps it? And at this late stage in the game, no one's mind is going to change. The liberals won't change. The conservatives can't change. And there's absolutely no middle ground. So you might say, well, what about the evangelical churches in this country we call America? <clears throat> While some evangelical churches are flourishing... Many languish in a state of spiritual stupor, self-satisfaction, and absolute unconcern. In many churches, traditions long ago replaced the fresh wind of God's spirit. We're divided racially, economically, doctrinally, do denominationally, and spiritually. And it goes on, he goes on to say that, uh, you know, in traveling around this country, you know, there's small congregations and large that are spiritually and doctrinally adrift. You know, after blessing and growth, the controversy in America that threatens to undo the church is happening amongst our midst. The ugliness has become so profound that even veteran church leaders have remarked that they've never seen anything so ugly in more than 50 plus years of ministry, proving the axiom that there's no fight like a church fight. Anything in the church pretty much now goes just like it does in the world. Unfortunately, one pastor said, I hear stories on a regular basis that we're going farther and farther from God's holy word and his holy ways. We should heed the words that are printed in Galatians 5.15. 
If we keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or we will be destroyed by each other. See, we're not as well off as we think we are. Everybody comes to church, they kind of put on a happy face, and everybody thinks everything's happy. But this world is going to hell in a handbasket, even in America. I mean, we've tried to legalize sin. That doesn't work. We've legalized taking the Bible out of schools, which used to be a textbook in public schools about 100 years ago. Then we decided that we didn't need prayer in schools, take the Ten Commandments out of schools, because rules don't apply to anybody anymore. But when you think about this, you know, we can't miss the individual implications of what's really happening. It's too easy to to look at what's happening. You know, especially people that attend a good, biblically sound um, church and say, you know, thank God we're not like them, or thank God we're not like that. But the ultimate implications comes down to two things. You and me. See, the Jews were set aside because of their unbelief. This unbelief came in spite of all the advantages that Paul mentions in Romans 9 that they had. What did they have? In Romans 9, verses 4 and 5, it said they had Abraham, they had Moses, they had David, they had the prophets, they had the covenants, they had the Torah, and they had the Messiah himself. And they still didn't have a clue. And they still would not believe in what they had. Look at what Paul says In verse 21, you stand by faith. And that's really the only way we can stand by faith. What Paul means more by this that simply believing in the right thing, believing in biblical things. Standing by faith means that you have received God's mercy, that you have confessed your sins, and that you run to the cross for forgiveness. But... That's not even the end of it. To stand by faith means that you live each day by faith. And that's what we have to do as Christians. We have to live each day by faith, trusting in God's mercy to you in Christ Jesus, knowing that you have no other hope except Jesus. You know, it's kind of crazy because, you know, a lot of people, they claim to follow Jesus. They wear you know, jewelry that's a cross or some other religious memento, or they have tattoos um, that are, you know, that are, uh, are, are, are of religious things and crosses and, um, you know, all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of things. But, you know, it's kind of funny because um, one of my friends, or an acquaintance, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say friend, probably more of an acquaintance, but Pastor Erwin Lutzer, he is the pastor now emeritus of the Moody Church in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he, he said something that was re- really interesting when I went to one of his meetings and talked to him personally um, at a church here in Detroit. And then I, I've heard him speak and I talked to him personally several times in Chicago as well. But, um, you know, he remarked about Lewis Sperry Schaefer's comments that, you know, if... If, if, if your faith as trusting in Christ does not take you to heaven, you're not going there. Mm-hmm. Think about that for a minute. And Dr. Lutzer said, you know, it's much more than that. He said that when he dies, if God asks him, why should I let you in heaven? He said he's going to reply, I'm trusting in Jesus and him alone for my salvo, and him alone for my salvation. And he said at that point, If God says, well, that's not enough, he said, I'll simply walk away and burn in hell forever because that's the only way to get there. Mm -hmm. And if faith in Christ is not enough to get you in heaven, Mm -hmm. then I too will go to hell because you know what? There's no plan B. Jesus is our only hope. You know, and I'm living and dying by my faith in him, in faith in Jesus Christ. You know, in church, we used to sing this hymn, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on 
Jesus' name. name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Mm -hmm. All other ground is sinking sand. Mm -hmm. All other ground is sinking sand. Mm -hmm. My question for each of us tonight is this. Can you say that? My only hope is in him. Because when you stand at the gates of heaven and God says, why should I let you in? Will you have an answer to give him? You know, and if your answer is, well, I was a member. I was a member at Wesley Methodist Church. Well, he's going to say, that's not good enough. You might say, well, I was an elder at Wayside Chapel. You know, you're in big trouble. You know, you might say, well, you know, my parents or my grandparents, they helped build that church. That's good, but that's not going to be the right answer. You know, you might say, but Lord, I lived a good life. You know, I'm happy for you. But you're not good enough. You know, you might say, but I fed the orphans in Nambia. Although that's wonderful, you know, that won't open the doors to heaven. You know, you might say, well, I was baptized by Father O'Reilly in 1962. I'm sure Father O'Reilly was probably a good man, but that's not going to get you into heaven. You know, you might say, well, you wouldn't believe how many spiritual books I have on my bookshelf. You know, those might be all good books, but they won't get you into heaven. And you might say, I listen to Pastor Curtis's sermons every week. <laughs> that won't help you either, not even close. See, if you want to go to heaven, you have to trust in Jesus Christ and trust in Him alone. Amen. You must go all in for the Son of God, who loved you, and as we've just learned from Holy Week, who died personally for you. Amen. You must believe in Jesus Christ so much that if he can't take you to heaven, mm -hmm. you aren't going to get there. Uh, right. See, we're saved by grace. We stand by faith, and we depend completely on the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, don't be too proud. Don't be too cocky. Don't be too arrogant. See, if you make it into heaven, it will only be be because of God's kindness towards you. And between now and then, stand by faith, live by faith, walk by faith. Run to the cross every single day. Lay hold of Christ and never let Christ go. The third and the last warning that I want to give you this evening is this. Don't take your blessings for granted. In verses 22 to 24 in this text, it says, Consider therefore the kindness and the sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of the olive tree... It is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, we were grafted into a cultivated olive tree. How much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? See, if God moved the Jews, removed them for their unbelief, and replaced the Jews for the Gentiles, he can graft the Jews back in, into his tree of blessing, you know, at any time. All of this is perfectly consistent with God's very nature. You know, but it, I think we should behold the severity towards the Jews for their unbelief. They were removed from the tree 2,000 years ago. You know, behold his goodness towards the Gentiles and allowing us, the Gentiles, to be part of his tree of blessing. You know, God still loves the people of Israel. They were his original chosen people. And the day is coming when they will all be coming back in. Maybe not all, but the majority. But what are we going to find out in the meantime is that God is building nothing but one thing, a bigger table for everyone. There's going to be plenty of seats around God's table, more seats than we think anybody could ever, uh, ever imagine. Anyone who wants to come in is going to have to have a seat at the table in the end. And between now and then, don't be too proud. Don't be too arrogant. Don't boast. 
There's no place for pride in the Christian life. There's no place for arrogance. And there's absolutely no place for boasting. But I want to conclude with the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. It said, not, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me. See, we're to boast upon the Lord, that we understand him, that we know him. That's our only boasting, that we boast upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason God does what he does is to demonstrate that he and he alone is our only source of salvation. It's not your wisdom, it's not your intellect, it's not your ability to memorize Bible verses that brought you to Jesus. You know, you are not a Christian because you're a good person. You're not a Christian because you're a church member or because your father was a pastor or your mother was a Sunday school teacher. None of that matters. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is only of the Lord. And God wants us to know that he is the reason we came to Christ. And in Christ, we find wisdom. In Christ, we find righteousness. In Christ, we find holiness. And in Christ, we find our redemption. Amen. You see, if we believe this, then our boast will be in the Lord alone. Nothing else, just in the Lord alone. When it comes to salvation, we contribute nothing. <clears throat> nothing but the sin that makes it necessary for us to be saved. God does everything. God does the rest. God chooses whom he pleases, and he does so by choosing those whom the world generally overlooks. If you believe what this passage teaches this evening, it will change the way we look at ourselves, change our thinking. It will change the way we talk about ourselves. Some of us talk so much about ourselves that we hardly talk about God at all. See, our real problem is the vast difference between our view and God's view. See, we look at the outward, but God looks at the inward. We value popularity. God values character. We look at intelligence. God looks at our heart. We honor those who have money. God honors those who have integrity. We talk about what we own. God talks about what we give away. We boast about those we know. God notices those that we serve. We have a list of our accomplishment. God looks for a contrite heart. We value our education. God values wisdom. We love size. God loves quality. We live for fame. God searches for humility. Our view is shallow. God's view is deep. Our view is temporary. God's view is eternal. We look closely at truth. We would discover that God destroys human pride in two ways. The first way, by sending a Savior to die on that hated, cruel Roman cross. By choosing the wild branches, us, the Gentiles, to be part of his family. We wouldn't have done it this way, but that brings us back to the fundamental point that God is different than us in our thinking and in all ways. God doesn't play by our rules. We think it should be fair. By arranging things this way, God destroys human pride and glorifies his son all at the same time. Boast in the Lord, make much of him. Praise his most holy name. We were made to do one thing, to boast in the Lord. We were created to magnify his name, not our name. We were born to honor him, not to try to get people to honor us. From the same God comes both two things, judgment and mercy. We've seen this from the text this evening. When you take your blessings for granted, you run the risk that God will take them away from you and give them to somebody else who will actually appreciate them. I know this personally. 
When we take our blessings for granted, God removes them from us and he gives them to someone else. How many of us have gone through this week complaining about anything? When we should have been praising him, griping when we should have been on our knees, giving thanks to God for every moment and for every abundant blessing that he's given to us. We just came from Holy Week, the most holy week of the whole Christian calendar. How much time did you spend on your knees thanking God for the glory and the magnificent sacrifice that he made on that brutal, bloody Roman cross? My friend Barney was right. Nothing matters except Christ. How sad it is that it takes most of us a lifetime to even come close to learning this truth. See, human wisdom says, I did it all myself. God's wisdom says, without God, I am nothing and I have nothing. Here's a very simple application that I want you to think about in the next few days. Boast about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Share with somebody else what Jesus Christ has done for you. It was kind of interesting. On Sunday after I preached, there was a little kid that came up to me right here in the church, and he said, I really like everything that you said, but how do you know God is real? And I told this little kid, I know God is real because I know how he changed me. You see, if you tell and share with what God has done for you, it won't only do good for your soul, it may lead someone else to eternal life. Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you for this text, and I thank you for this word. Father, if we have anything to boast on, it's to boast about the goodness, the greatness, the judgment, and the mercy of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us reshape our thinking. Let us reshape our hearts. Let us write these words on the tablets of our hearts so they have import and impact in the way we think and the way we live and the way we speak and in the way we conduct ourselves day in and day out. Let us be more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's funny, I put this shirt on this morning and it says, love like Jesus, if we could only do that. Love like Jesus, be like Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, think like Jesus. Oh, what a better world we would have. Amen. I pray that we all do just that. Amen. That we model ourselves after the one we call our Savior, our Lord, our Master, and our King. And it's in his name we pray. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.